I guess. And uh, oh yeah, heart of gold, heart of gold, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, you can definitely yeah, so- you can definitely tell that in this in this video. And uh, so it's like on, on one hand, this fellow is like super smart. On the other hand, he's got humility, and he's not this egomaniac kind of guy. Right. He's got. A, he's one of the humblest people I ever met, honestly, and uh, awesome brother. Uh, yeah, so feel free, you know, 20, maybe maybe we have to, maybe we won't actually get to play the demo because it's an hour long. Yeah, yeah let just, me, you, you, he does, next. yeah, he does early on, he does show the motor, but he won't go into more of the details. We're going to play uh, a segment tonight, maybe uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, um, and we'll stop it there. And if people want to see more, uh, we can play it uh, again in, in further programs. Yeah. Yeah, if it's so, each program, next four programs, we could do fifteen minute segments or something like that. And just let us know if you want to see more. Uh, go ahead and play the first fifteen. Right. Minutes, so. Okay. Well, here we go. Power motor, and he told me a little earlier today that he was born in the state of ignorance and has never left, which is actually a very good position for a scientist to be in. It's the ones who think they know everything who can't learn anything. So Ron is a good researcher. He began building motors and radios back in the third grade and then he started taking trips to the junkyards and collected all the parts he could from uh, even steering columns from wrecked Model T's and his father called him a scavenger. This was back in the early 30s in Trout Lake, Washington near the base of Mount Adams and he made a lot of sophisticated motors and unusual electrical devices during that time. He joined the Navy he became an instructor in math and electronics, and he uh, was also mingling with people who were involved in the famous Philadelphia experiment. This really sparked his curiosity into electronics. He spent 35 years working for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and he also um, did a lot of experiments during that time with his motors. He built his first electric car in the 70s, converted a 66 Dodge Dart with a 24 volt, 32 horsepower starter generator off a B-52 bomber that went into that Dodge Dart. So that was a pretty interesting little project. And he's also uh, designed and built several other fascinating circuits which have been uh, presented to our conferences before. So let's give a warm welcome to Ron Brandt. God dang, you didn't talk long enough. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll, you'll have plenty to say. Uh, I've got a few comments to make here before we start on this motor. Uh, I've got some theories uh, that I would like to express. If everybody that's working on anything. I don't care uh, what type of uh, improvement, what kind of energy improvement, as long as it cleans up the environment. I'll do what I can to help. First of all, we haven't got much time at the rate we're destroying this planet we live on. I would like to think before I leave that there's hope that my grandchildren might grow up, have some air to breathe. And everybody's going to have to get into the act, put their egos aside, and remember there ain't no luggage racks on hearses. And uh, we'll get the job done. And it don't make any difference who, who does the job as long as it gets done. And. Uh, a lot of things have been held up by government. A lot of it's been held up by egos that uh, want to make more money and control everything worldwide this or worldwide that. Well, we're at the point now where we don't have that luxury to uh, control it all for one person or for one company or another. I think that if everything went to market today, that is feasible, that's working, it would take 20 years with everybody putting everything they had into the act. It would take 20 years to turn the d- destruction of our planet around. And by that time, Standard Oil is going to run out of oil anyhow, so they shouldn't be worrying by then or what else uh, in that respect. So. When we had the gas shortage back in 73, I figured, well, it's time. 
Uh, I had built motors. I'd seen what could be done. And uh, I wanted to uh, get it going. And I figured, well, at the price of gasoline, a dollar and a half a gallon, it was there for a while. Maybe people will take a, take a look at electric power. So I built one. The only problem was the gas shortage ended and the gas price of gas went back down to 49 cents and so nobody give a damn. They didn't care how much, how much air, how much oxygen they destroyed uh, with the gasoline and the diesel fuel. But if you stop and think, if you're driving a car with 400 cubic inches and it's turning 3,000 revolutions a minute, there's 400 cubic inches times 4,000 going into that engine. And it don't make any difference whether you're burning clean fuel or dirty fuel. You have destroyed more oxygen in one hour than you'll breathe in a month. One hour driving your car will consume and destroy the oxygen, regardless of how clean your engine's running. That, en that what came out the exhaust pipe is not breathable for human consumption anymore. It has to be re rejuvenated and reprocessed. So we have to think about this in a standpoint of reality. The other reality is the World Health Organization, 10 years ago, well, actually almost 13 years ago now, took oxygen level tests on people in isolated communities where the uh, population was fairly stable. They went back 10 years later and took the same people in the same communities and found that there was a 10% drop in oxygen in the blood from what it was 10 years earlier. At that rate, the metamorphic diseases, the moles, the fungi, are going to be killing us all off in the next five or six years if it continues to drop at that rate. We're an oxygen-based organism, and we have to have oxygen to live. No matter how you figure it, we've got to have at least a fair supply of oxygen. And now we're getting down, like in Portland, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they've done an oxygen test downtown Portland, 14% oxygen. At 14%, we haven't got enough. You wonder why people are shooting at each other and why they're ramming each other's cars and everything? Because they're, they're running out of oxygen. They can't think straight no more when they get down that low. Anyhow, so much for so much for my my talking. I <coughs> designed this motor to try to be as efficient as possible. In that, uh, the motors I bought, uh, like the 32 horse motor I got from for the car, is a conventional DC motor with brushes, has field coils, has uh, windings on the armature and it looked to me like why should I take half of the electricity and create a field and then the other half to create another field to fight it why not take a fixed field that we got in the magnets set it up so the magnets are in a, per in a permanent state of keepership and then use electricity to induce the magnets to move to another place in other words, make one piece of metal a little less attractive than the next. Now this, that's a little bit loud, uh, this is what's in that motor. Just an identical duplicate to this, only it has 16 magnets. Each one of those magnets on a straight lift will pick up almost a 100 pound piece of steel. There's a lot of torque involved in the magnets. There's only five thousandths clearance between the magnet and the stator. Now this is just one piece of stator. There's an inch and a half stack in there. And the, when, what power I put in only makes one segment a little less attractive than the one that's not getting any power. So the motor turns. Oh, I guess it would help if I turned the power on. Now, we've got infinite speed control, any speed we want. We've got instantaneous reverse. Anytime we want to reverse it, 
and it will reverse at 6,000 RPM, but if it isn't bolted down, it'll jump up in the air six feet. I know, I had a neighbor come in and I had it running at 6,000 and he flipped the switch accidentally and the motor was up in the air and I catching the motor with it running and trying to shut this down at the same time. It wasn't funny. Uh, anyhow, with this design, there's no brushes in the motor. There's only two things in there to wear out, and that's the two bearings. The bearings I put in there cost $7.90 a piece, and they're 10,000 hour bearings. Now, in a car, how far would you drive in 10,000 hours? The motor is designed so the bearings are easy to replace without having to get into the working parts of the motor. It's not that technical. I tried to make every the old saying, keep it simple, stupid. Well, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Ease of maintenance and maximum efficiency. And uh, there may be better motors. And there, I can improve on this. This is my first prototype. I made a mistake in this one. This I wanted 49 slots in here, and the uh, draftsman, or the computer uh, guy that's done my CAD work for me, uh, he marked on the print 49 slots. I didn't count them. I faxed it off to Lemonix, and Lemonix made me 48 slots, and that's why it growls. Uh, if, if the 49 slots would be in there, it would be as smooth as could be. So that's an error that's only there, and I own up to the mistake because I didn't count the slots. Now, uh, let's see here. Now this is on 50 volts for division. I'll bring this down to, to the line. Yeah. And we're putting in uh, uh, about 80 volts now that it's showing there. This line here is hooked across a 002 shunt. And I'm set on, on uh, 20 millivolts per division. And so that is indicating the amperage is going into the motor. Now, uh, we'll turn this over here a little bit. Now you can see the little pulses I'm putting in. Very small amount of amperage I'm putting in. I'm getting as much back. We'll put this on zero. Get it as accurate as possible. For, for the perfectionist. Now, these, see these pulses that are going in are very short in duration. These back EMF pulses down here are wider, actually, than the forward EMF pulses. This, everything below the line, I'm capturing in these condensers here to use in the next pulse so that I don't need to take quite so much electricity out of the battery. Uh, the, um, now, this, this motor is equally as good a generator as it is a motor. Now, I'm going to shut the power off going in. And you'll notice the sine wave, but the sine wave, as it slows down, collapses. And it's that we're just hooked on to one phase of the three phase. I have here a three phase bridge rectifier that's taking and snubbing the motor. Actually, if I take that off, I'll have a thousand more RPM, and I'll have real long down here. But that runs the risk of burning out my transistors, so I keep it snubbed down a little bit. The, you know. If 
find a quiet speed so we can talk. Um, but I designed this basically for electric cars because of the torque. The torque is unlimited. Yeah. All right. Sir T, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for showing that, Ron. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> we showed, I think we showed about 12 or 13 minutes, something like that. I was noticing the audio was getting way out of sync, and uh, so uh, maybe Brother Litke can help me with that. It looked like the video, the, uh, the video and the audio are a little bit out of sync, so when his lips were moving, he wasn't actually saying what his lips were doing. But anyway, you get the gist yeah. of it. <laughs> So, well, it, it's fine. A lot of times it's, it's showing the machine or the oscilloscope, so that's fine. You don't notice it as much there. Right. Uh, so I think you did a great job there. Thank you for transferring that over. And uh, but I, I like uh, uh, I like the uh, little talk he gave at the beginning, uh, where he's you know he talks about uh, an hour's worth of just driving your car, how much oxygen that uses up, and yep. uh, more than you breathe in a month. And I think it's even more now. I think it's more like what you breathe in a year. Uh, yeah, people. People have no idea how much we're wasting oxygen, and of course, the big jets are consuming a hundred times more than your car, or maybe a thousand times more than yeah, your car. Yeah, huge uh, amounts of air. Yep, huge amounts. And uh, Ron used to actually believe the big jets that are flying super high are the ones using up all the ozone. That's uh, that's where most of the ozone's going. Uh, you know, he said that the the CFCs, you know, where you weren't allowed to use certain refrigerants and certain types of spray and all this propellants and all that. He said that's all baloney. He said that stuff doesn't go up there. He said uh, he he would say, uh, you know, the jets uh, flying, they're sucking up that ozone. Ozone's a form of oxygen. They're sucking up that ozone, and they're they're the ones that's using up all the ozone. Which I don't know who's doing it, but I know Ron is a pretty bright guy, so. Um, you know, it's definitely being used up. Everybody agrees the ozone layer is disappearing. And so whatever is responsible needs to stop. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's very clear that even in uh, in the early 90s there, Ron was definitely aware that we've got to start cleaning up uh, our act down here. The, uh, the planet's not going to be uh, able to support life. And uh, it's really, you know, great to see that, uh, that he was really trying back then too yeah he would probably do one or two of those type of presentations uh a year well one yeah but not always when it get videoed uh, actually most of the time it did not get videos in the 60s and 70s even the 40s he became much right after he had his first electric car self-running uh he became much more uh known about and uh uh, you know, he would just go into a town and talk, make a phone, you know, make five or ten phone calls, and he'd have a hundred people show up, and it'd be at the at the parking lot of a of a big mall or something. You know, it just in other words, he'd, have, he'd give a demo, he'd give a talk, and give a demo, and that's how he did it. And uh, uh, I don't know why, but uh, you know, people would show up to see that self running car, and uh, whatever else he'd bring, he'd bring a few other things and talk to people and try to get them to wake up and participate in the solutions. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, back then. yeah, it's interesting because that that's the type of thing that would start these urban legends where you had groups of people that would see this firsthand and they tell their friends and they tell your friends. But most people that heard about it wouldn't have actually seen it. And they they sort of, you know, uh, repeat it out there to other people. And, yeah. uh, you know, news doesn't travel that fast uh, back then when you didn't have instantaneous no. uh, communication. So it, it becomes well, I, urban legend type material. Yeah, their friends would say, oh, that's impossible, you know, forget about it. And they'd say, did you ride in the car for 200 miles? No, I didn't ride the car for 200 miles. You know, stuff like this, you know. Uh, but uh, Ron had, uh, and we always do, the ministry always has uh, hundreds of independent engineers that verify everything, literally. Uh, thousands, usually, uh, nowadays. Anyway, so probably in that first electric car that Ron did, that ran on the Brant switch or the Tesla switch, uh, the first electric car, uh, I'd say he had probably 1,000 independent engineers, uh, roughly, but, you know, back then it was hard to make a video and put it, and you didn't have the internet to put right. it up on. Right. So, uh, you know, what are you going to do with it? You know what I mean? Even if you had 1,000 people testifying on a video, uh, which is, you know, pretty hard. Most of them in those days until today, most engineers are afraid to testify that something's over unity or self-running. That's right. That's because I know they'll they'll get all excited about. It. They'll see it and they're happy to see it and they get all excited about. It, but they're not going to testify because that'll make them. Everybody will say, "Oh, that's impossible. You're an idiot." You know, make them look bad. You know, so yeah. Very few people have the courage like you did, brother Martin, to testify. And uh, we've had thousands now that actually have done, done written testimonies or video testimonies or audio testimonies. 
and we put a lot of them up on our page called Independent Engineers. Well, that uh, you so. know, and that uh, was something that uh, when I when I first met you and everything uh, that I saw is like you know, man, you know, and I can definitely understand this. You know, you've had so many people in the past, uh, you know, senior devices, and you know, and checked them out. You know, and uh, and these are qualified people, and yet. They don't want to put their name out there and they don't want to risk their jobs because, uh, you know, they know that, you know, people will look down on that stuff, you know, because they're going to be judged by their peers and their peers says it's impossible. And yeah. uh, so I, I definitely understand it. But, you know, back when I met you, it was it was a it was a lot worse than it is now. In other words, things are starting Absolutely. to open up now. Yeah. So um, yeah, very, very much change, and and I think we've 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 been a big point, a big uh, instrument in the change. In other words, back when I joined the ministry, nobody except the ministry even believed our over unity was was possible. Uh, nobody believed it was even possible, and now the, I'd say over fifty percent of the world believes it's possible and uh, doable, and so that's a huge difference. We've educated yep. uh, five billion people, four billion people, something like that, three billion people. You know, it's it's a huge, uh, a huge step in the right direction, and. So people sometimes think we're not making much progress. We're making huge progress. So people just aren't looking at the progress. They're trying to they think progress is when you get it in Walmart, you know, <laughs> which, which uh, is progress, too, if we can get it and sell them at Walmart. But uh, we've made huge progress just by educating people and helping them understand reality better, um, getting them off the program. And thank you for, by the way, I didn't ever thank you on the show, I don't think, for helping set up the website. If it wasn't for the web, oh, you helping up set, set up the website, we wouldn't have the Independent Engineers page. And of course, Brother Litke too. I uh, would thank you both for uh, yeah. putting that up. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of got it started, but then I, then I had to offload it on a poor Brother Litke. 